At this time, it would be the offering for the Cottage Grove Education Fund. Again, we ask that because you are not able to be with us at this time, uh, you can mail your donations here. Otherwise, uh, there is a way through Facebook uh, or through the Cottage Grove Christian Reformed Church website uh, that you can donate through links there. Uh, again, if you have questions, by all means, you can message the church's Facebook page. Uh, you can send emails. Uh, try and get in contact with us if you would like to donate. Uh, and if you would like to give your weekly offering through there, it would be much appreciated. Uh, again, we uh, are unable to take them at this time, but uh, there is electronic means uh, to do so. At this time, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to a very familiar passage, Psalm 23. Psalm 23. Uh, and then, if you do have access via computer or via phone, uh, I also invite you to turn to one of the three forms of unity. We are going to look at the Canons of Dort this evening as well. Uh, first Head of Doctrine, Articles 11, 12, and 13. So again, Psalm 23, the much beloved Psalm, and then the Canons of Dort, Articles 11, 12, and 13. First, Psalm 23. Hear now the word of the Lord, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Turning now to the Canons of Dort, the first head of doctrine, Article 11, Article 12, and Article 13. Again, uh, the first head of doctrine speaks of election, so that is the context of Articles 11, 12, and 13 in the Canons of Dort. Beginning at Article 11. And as God himself is most wise, unchangeable, omniscient, and omnipotent, so the election made by him can neither be interrupted nor changed, recalled or annulled, neither can the elect be cast away nor their number diminished. Article 12. The elect in due time, though in various degrees and in different measures, attain the assurance of this, their eternal and unchangeable election, not by inquisitively prying into the secret and deep things of God, but by observing in themselves with a spiritual joy and holy pleasure the infallible fruits of election pointed out in the word of God, such as a true faith in Christ, filial fear, a godly sorrow for sin, a hungering and thirsting after righteousness, etc., Article 13, the sense and certainty of this election afford to the children of God additional matter for daily humiliation before him, for adoring the depths of his mercies, for cleansing themselves, and rendering grateful returns of ardent love to him who first manifested so great love towards them. The consideration of this doctrine of election is so far from encouraging remissiveness in the observance of the divine commandments or from sinking men in carnal security that these and the just judgment of God are the usual effects of rash presumption or of idle and wanton trifling with the grace of election in those who refuse to walk in the ways of the elect. 
That is the catechetical reading for this evening. People of God, beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to the passage this evening and we look upon it as a familiar one. Psalm 23, a psalm so familiar that even non-Christians are able to quote it at will. It's something that even 10, 20 years ago we would hear on TV even. Psalm 23, a psalm of David, one who speaks of the Lord as a shepherd. Now, those who hear this sermon might look at this psalm and think, there's so much here, how are you going to be able to write uh, just a, a half hour sermon on this? And by all means, you are correct. There is an absolute smorgasbord of theological and exegetical significance here. And we are only going to take just a small portion. There is by no means a way that I could, in as short a time as I am allowed, to wrap not only my head, but to convey the deep truth here in Psalm 23 in such a way that it would give a full appreciation of the text. But, that being said, I pray that the Lord would give me guidance so that the portion I am able to give this evening is beneficial and a blessing. The first thing I want to look at this evening is going to be peace. Specifically, peace in the provision. And of course, I love my alliterations. The second thing we're going to look at this evening is peace in the path. And the third thing this evening, or the third of our three points, is peace in the plan. So we're going to look at peace three ways, peace in the provision, peace in the path, and peace in the plan. As we come to Psalm 23, we cannot come as one comes to just a psalm and look at it in just its clothing. The book of Psalms was not written merely one piece to be isolated as one thing and then another thing and then another thing. Rather, in order to understand the rich context around it, I invite you to turn back a page, or if you're online, to look back at Psalm 22. Now, Psalm 22 is quite substantial here, but the one thing I want to pull out specifically is that you cannot read Psalm 23 without first reading Psalm 22 if you're going to look at this in the full context of it. And Psalm 22 is one of those wonderful psalms that is quoted on the cross. Piece by piece, bit by bit, we see Christ on the cross here. Verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The words of Christ who cries out. We see that... Even in this, the good shepherd is there crying upon the cross. And yet that is the light in which Psalm 23 is then read as it comes right next to it. Earlier in the service we read Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and and everything in it. The scope of his creation. But look again at Psalm 22. Psalm 23 doesn't come from Psalm 24's everything is under the Lord's and everything is created by him. But yes, you could argue that. But rather, where does Psalm 23 come from? Psalm 23 comes in the light of Psalm 22. The rejection of God, of his Holy One. You see, Psalm 23 is truly based on the cross. The first issuance of provision 
is the one who is given as provision. When we read Psalm 23 in the first phrase that is so familiar to us, the Lord is our shepherd, who is the Lord? In Psalm 23, he is the shepherd. In Psalm 24, he is the creator. In Psalm 22, with the eyes that we are able to see from the New Testament looking back to the Old, not only is it, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Lord rejecting. But is the Lord rejecting his son on the cross? Which points us back to that provision all the more. It points us back to who the true shepherd is. I want to talk about that word shepherd for a second. That word shepherd is found everywhere in the Bible. It's found as early as Abel in Genesis. Abel was a shepherd. His brother Cain, who murdered him, was a man who tended crops. Abraham was a shepherd. In fact, the dispute that he had with uh, with Lot was, well, our shepherds are getting in arguments with each other and there's problems between our two families and Lot goes one way and Abraham goes another way. Moses was a shepherd. At first he went out, was cast out of Egypt and was trained as a shepherd in Midian. But eventually he became the shepherd of the people of God in the desert. Jesus is considered a shepherd. Strike the shepherd and the sheep shall flee. The apostles were considered not only fishers of men, but shepherds of the church. I think specifically of the passage where Peter is restored. Jesus says to him three times, Peter, feed my lambs. Peter, feed my sheep. In 1 Peter 5, we see that pastoring is shepherding. It is a function of being a pastor. It is to shepherd the sheep of God as an under-shepherd. There is a long line of what it means to be a shepherd, and yet being a shepherd is not an enviable job in any of these cases. When David is a shepherd... David is a shepherd of his his family's sheep. He is so insignificant that he is sent to look after the sheep when Samuel comes to anoint the new king and all the other brothers are there. And what does Jesse say? Well, I do have one other son, but he's just out watching the sheep. When the angels come to declare the good news of great joy that shall be for all the people, who do they come to? Do they come to the kings? No, they come to shepherds. Shepherds, the men that spent their lives in the fields. When you read John 10... You see that hired hands, hired shepherds, care nothing of the sheep, and so when the wolves come, they run. Shepherds were not held in high regard. Yes, they were workers, they were industrious, they lived off the land, they uh, were a necessary and essential worker. But they were also taken advantage of. They were also considered the lowest of society. They were also seen as those who maybe couldn't be trusted. And yet the Lord is called a shepherd. David says the Lord is my shepherd. You see, how do you know the quality of a shepherd? The quality of the shepherd is seen in the lives of his sheep. Verse 1 states that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. If you had a bad shepherd who didn't know where he was going or what he was doing, 
He wouldn't know where to lead the sheep. He couldn't find food. He would lead them into rocky areas where they might get lost or attacked. He wouldn't be able to find water, and so the sheep would dry up, and they would drop from exhaustion and from dehydration. You see, if you had a bad shepherd, you didn't have very many sheep that would stick around. But with the Lord as our shepherd, David says, I shall not be in want. The provision of this shepherd is sufficient. But the, the provision of the shepherd is also personal. Notice the pronouns that David uses here. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and thy staff, they comfort me. These are singular pronouns here. He doesn't speak about, O oh Lord, please guard and guide your people Israel. He doesn't say, Lord, you have been wonderful to us. He says, Lord, you guide and guard me. The Lord's provision as a shepherd is personal. We see this even through the words of our own shepherd, Jesus Christ, who says when he taught us to pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. You see, it is personal. Our shepherd stoops to each and every one of us to give us daily bread. He makes us to lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside quiet waters. And he does it for every single one of us. For you and for me. In our catechetical reading of the Canons of Dort, Article 12 shows us that assurance of this, their eternal and unchangeable election, not by inquisitively prying, but rather it is given in due time through various stages and in differing measure. Our walk is not like everybody else's walk. Our saunter in this path is not like everybody else's saunter. And so the Lord knows his sheep. He personally takes care of us and knows our feeble ways. He knows who needs to walk in the front and who needs to walk in the back. He knows who the right and the left sheep are. He calls each one by name. This is a personal provision and an intimate knowledge one to the other. The second thing, or the third thing rather, I want to look at in the provision here is that it is complete. When he makes us to lie down in green pastures, when he leads us beside quiet waters, he restores our soul. Now that is a, a, a wonderful idiom there, meaning there is a fullness, there is a completeness, there is a wonderfulness that is completely filled. He doesn't just give you enough to get you by. He doesn't just give you your little bit to make it through the day. He doesn't just say, okay, 
I know that you would probably be better up here, but I'm going to give you down here because really that's all you need to survive. No, the Lord provides in an overabundance. When we look at the psalm as a whole, verse 5 says, Our cup overflows. The provision of the Lord is that which is complete. It is also current. It is also something that he continually does. There is a completion here, but in the language that is used in Psalm 23, it is a continuing action. Reading one of the commentaries on this passage, uh, a scholar said, this could be read with gerunds instead. With, he is guiding me in paths of righteousness. He is leading me beside quiet waters. He is making me to lie down in green pastures. This is not something that the Lord has done and will never do again. But it is something that he has done and continues to do. This is a providential care that is not isolated, but is continued. This provision is complete. It is current. We must also have peace in the path. Notice that this provision is not merely an instance, but as it continues, it continues in a way where we are being led. Verse four states, sorry, verse three states, He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. We are being led by our shepherd. We are being moved and motioned by our shepherd. This is not a stationary thing. It's not just a point-to-point thing. But rather we are being moved down a path. There is a way here. This way is determined by the shepherd. He doesn't just let us run off. And yet we do it anyways. We attempt to. Isaiah 53 specifically says, We like sheep have gone astray. We in our wonderful sheepy brains can't see the path. And we don't want the path that we can't see. We don't want the path that's difficult. We don't want the path that may be right in front of us, but we'd rather go find the greener grass that we might see. Even though it leads us to the den of vipers. Even though it leads us to the craggy hole. Oh, I found a little green grass over here. I'd rather go this way. Ooh, I see something shiny. I'm going to go that way. As we are on our journey of life, as we are on our journey that we are being guided into, we would rather just turn around. We'd rather go down the path that we would want to see. And yet, the Lord guides us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Our shepherd, being a good shepherd, guides us in paths of righteousness. That phrase there, for his name's sake, has been taken 500 different ways, but I'd rather just look at it simply tonight, just in this one way. When he guides us in paths of righteousness, when the Lord looks at us and says, this is the way you are to walk, remember how good a shepherd is, is reflected in the provision for the sheep, but it's also reflected in the way he takes the sheep. He guides us in paths of righteousness 
because that is the way that he has been instructed to by his Father. He guides us in paths of righteousness. The Lord guides us in paths of righteousness because that is who he is. He doesn't guide us in paths that lead to destruction. He doesn't guide us in paths that lead to death. He doesn't show us the wide way, the easy path, and says, all right, go ahead, run free. He guides us in paths of righteousness, whether they are difficult or whether they are easy. Because he is a righteous shepherd. His name is holy and righteous. And so just as God, as Article 11 shows to us, that he is unchangeable, he is omniscient, he is omnipotent, so to the path that he has declared for us is unchangeable. You see, even as we look at this through the eyes of election, as we look at how God moves us in paths of righteousness to show us that we as his children are the elected ones of God, he moves us and shows us who he is by how he deals with us. The way is determined by the shepherd already because of who he is. Because he is an omniscient, omnipotent God. Because he is the one who knows the way. He knows what path is good for you and for me. A pastor who was delivering a sermon on Psalm 23 put it this way. Sheep are about two and a half to three feet tall. The average person is about 5'6 to 6'6. Six, six. You can see a lot more at 6 feet tall than you can at 2 feet tall. But when the 2 foot tall sheep declares that he knows what he needs to do and how he needs to do it and goes off in that direction, he's doing so with a 2 foot perspective. And yet God has a 6 foot perspective. While we as sheep may see that two-foot path to the log, we don't see the wolf that's behind it. While we, in our two-foot perspective as a sheep, see that wonderful green patch of grass over there, but we don't see the snake hiding in it, you see our good shepherd knows the path. And so even though we might say, Lord, why is this happening? What is going on? How in the world is this the path of righteousness? Even though our frustration may get us time and time again, we have assurance. God Breathes through his word. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Just as we too, pastors, have been called to lay down the lives for our sheep. We have recently celebrated a graduation here. Those who are watching may know. Those who are not part of our church congregation may not know that Pastor Carey just graduated seminary. And having gone to the same seminary for a couple of years, knowing some of those same professors, hearing some of the same words, one thing that they will tell us time and time and time again, this isn't a nine to five. Being a shepherd is a 24-7, 365 life change. You don't get to go to church and just work normally and then go home and have it all just be left at the door. The pain that your flock feels is the pain that you will feel. The joy that your flock feels is the joy that you will feel. 
the wonder and appreciation, the plan that God might have that you might not see. Well, that's one way of being a shepherd. And as such, we are called to be under shepherds. Elders, pastors, even deacons. The offices of the church are seen to be under shepherds of Jesus Christ. And as such, when he guides us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, they too are called to be in the mold of the good shepherd. In verse 4, I want to highlight something real quick. Look at the tools that he uses. Yes, we might have this two-foot sheeply perspective, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't guide from a six-foot perspective. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When I was in college out in Iowa, when I was first starting, I had a theology professor ask me, if you were going to name a ministry... Let's say you went off somewhere and you had to build a ministry from the ground up. What would you name it? After a week of thought and about three pages of writing, I finally came to it and said, you know what? I think I would call my ministry Rod and Staff Ministry. After Psalm 23, his rod and his staff, they comfort me. You see, the rod is used in two ways. And his staff is used in two ways. A shepherd's rod is used to beat back the enemies. When there is a wolf or there is a bear or there is something that could threaten the flock, the rod of the shepherd is used to beat it back, to protect and preserve. The rod is also used to smack obstinate sheep. Those that cannot be goaded one way or the other, Those that are stubborn and foolhardy can be smacked real quick with a rod. The staff is also used two ways. The staff is what we would typically think of as a shepherd crook. That crook is used to reach and guide sheep. It is used to move or maneuver sheep. Move them, guide them gently and corral them one way into another. It's used to extend the reach of the shepherd. The crook is typically used to pull the neck or the head of the sheep. Sometimes, depending on the size of the crook, it can even be used to hook around the sheep and pull them across. The shepherd uses these tools in an aiding of the sheep to say, here's my perspective. You want to know where you're supposed to go? Look at the rod and look at the staff. Article 12 this evening, especially in the Canons of Dort. Such assurance comes not by inquisitive searching into the deep things of God, but by noticing within themselves with spiritual joy and delight the unmistakable fruits of election pointed out in God's word. Such as true faith in Christ a childlike fear of God, a godly sorrow for sins, a hunger and thirst for righteousness, etc. You see, the rod and the staff that God uses as his shepherd, as a shepherd, not only are the people within our lives, the shepherds and under-shepherds around us, but his very word. And that word produces within us A maneuvering to the path. He uses that rod and that staff to nurture and to bring closer the people of God. To beat away the enemies and the wolves in sheep's clothing. Finally, this evening I want to take a look at the peace and the plan. The peace and the plan specifically in verses 5 and 6 this evening. Now, I'm not going to go into the big, huge theological and exegetical concepts of 
a literary analysis here, although I know if Professor Vanderhart would ever hear this, he would love for me to talk about how this is a chiasm. You can look it up on your own. But when the shepherd or the host comes to Psalm 23 in verse 5, you see that the perspective shifts. The shepherd is now a host. He prepares a table before us. He provides the table and he sets it up. You see, he provides the fruit that guides or that litters the table. Not only is it the provision, but we can also see this as the fruit that is produced in the lives of those who have walked through the valley of the shadow of death. Article 13 in particular, after Article 12, enumerates some of the true things, but it says that Article 13 shows that these true fruits... So that these true fruits, they don't make us lax, but rather they should jumpstart us. That they should maneuver us into a position of being willing and ready to serve. And so as the table is spread out in front of us, as it is done in the presence of my enemies... We are anointed. Anointing is also a very specific thing in Scripture. Anointing is done specifically of prophets, of priests, and of kings. Of the three primary offices of the Old Testament, there is an anointing that happens with oil. The oil that is poured over the head. In fact, there is such a wonderful, vivid picture of it, how oil is poured over the head of the anointed of the Lord and runs down into the beard. The idea that we are coated completely in the office that God has bestowed upon us. And so as we are anointed and our cup overflows, we are covered by this oil, the scent of righteousness, the scent of the office that we have been given. And so we are not to be lax in what we are called to do. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this understanding of election, the idea of being a sheep of God should not be, well, I'm elect, so I can just, you know, I'm hands off, who cares? I know I'm safe. No, by God's just judgment, this does usually happen to those who casually take for granted the grace of God's election or engage in idol and brazen and talk about it but are unwilling to walk in the ways of the chosen. Coming from a more modern translation of Article 13. You see, as we are anointed, we are anointed to do the work that God has placed in front of us. But that work is not idle. That work is not devoid of meaning, and that work is not something that can just be frittered about. You see, there is a promise here. The elect of God, the ones who have a table prepared before them, are given status not merely as officers or as officiants, but rather they are given anointing as sons and daughters as co-heirs with Christ. And the promise that is given is that surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The host promises the future of his flock. Our final destination is the house of the Lord. We are anointed to dwell in the presence of God forever. You see, the provision that we are given is not merely one of here and now, but it's the provision for the future. It's a provision for things that we cannot see. It's a provision for a path that may be dark and scary, full of shadow, shadow of death itself. As even today we are in the shadow of the virus. The shadow of fear.
And yet we are called to have peace in that path. That the shadow should not overtake. That we do not let the, the path overcome us. But that we trust in the one who leads us down it. And that our promised plan is one that is guaranteed and assured by God. Even one of our favorite hymns speaks of this. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. You see, this is our story, and this is our song. And so may we live a life that is praising our Savior all the day long. May our shepherd, may the one who guides the sheep, provides for the sheep, plans for the sheep, may the assurance that we have be a blessing. And may it give us peace so that when we hear that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, May we not say, yeah, but what comes next? But who's the one that's guiding it all? May we say, as people, salt and light in this world, do not fear. The shadows will pass. The Lord is good. And the good shepherd will make us lack nothing. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, as we come before you this evening, we thank you for who you are, for what you've given to us as your children, for what you promised to us as those who are elect in Christ. And so, Lord, let us be your light and salt in this world. Lord, as we leave this place, as we go upon our weekly journeys, Lord, provide for us. Lord, keep our perspective, that which is vertical, toward you, the creator of heaven and earth. So, Lord, may we see our comfort in life and in death be our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And may we be wholly willing and ready to live for him. Lord, give us grace to see this. Give us mercy to walk it through. This we ask in the name, for the name's sake of our Lord and Savior, our Shepherd, Jesus Christ. Through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen.